everybody should be able to see the opening slide here that says conifers developing an understanding of their growth and anatomy. Um, so this is a program that I put together about two years ago. And uh, I did it for the uh, American Conifer Society meeting when they lived in, uh, when they met in uh, Bowling Green. Uh, and I thought that uh, because of some of the information uh, that was in here, it might be something of interest to uh, you as master gardeners. And so this is uh, a little bit uh, on the technical end of it, as far as uh, you know, master gardeners are concerned. It, it was written, uh, or I put it together for, specifically for people who think that conifers make the sun rise and set every day. But I'll uh, I'll run through this, and it talks a little bit about some different things that are associated with conifers. And so, as we look at this. Uh, and I, I've got some terms in here that I will uh, I will just define um, as we as we go through it. Um, uh, but it it does have a little bit of interest to it. Uh, I had a real interest in geology when I was coming up, uh, and I was making the decision in junior high school which direction I wanted to go, whether it was in uh, geology or whether it was into horticulture. And so I decided on horticulture because I knew back then, back in the 1960s, uh, that if I went into geology, I'd end up working for some oil company, and I didn't want to be sitting out in the Gulf of Mexico when the hurricanes were coming in. So anyway, uh, I ended up uh, doing that, but I still have a lot of interest in uh, geology. And so I'll be touching on some of that. Now, gymnosperms is a term that we use in taxonomy to refer to all of the conifers. And so all of the conifers that we have, everything that you could think of is a gymnosperm. These do not have true uh seeds with fruit around them so uh also included in this as a true gymnosperm is ginkgo and it does not the ginkgo doesn't look anything at all like a a uh, a conifer or a, a needled evergreen that we think of as being our conifers and also the cycads are are in this group uh and cycads are ancient plants uh they were here uh, when the first dinosaurs became uh, prevalent uh, on Earth. And so with the gymnosperms, we've got 14 families in 88 genera, and th there are only 1,088 species. And that is, I list the uh, source for that particular number or those three numbers are uh, there. So when we look at conifers, we typically think of something like this pine tree, uh, and it has pine cones on it. And so people tend to, to ask, uh, you know, what is the best type pine tree? Thinking that they're all pines. Well, there are a lot of things other than pines out there. There are, there are 14 families worth. Uh, and pines are just one member of one genus of one of those families. Now, the other plants that we are familiar with, in addition to gymnosperms, are the angiosperms. And the angiosperms are the maples, the ashes, the birches, the begonias, uh, tobacco, chrysanthemums. The list goes on and on and on and on. So most of the plants that we're familiar with are actually angiosperms. And in addition to this, there are some monocots, uh, which are palms and the grasses. And then uh, most of these are dicots. And when you look at um, the, uh, the dicots, okay. When you look at the, uh, the dicots and the, the monocots and all of the other angiosperms, we've got 405 families compared to the, the 14 families in the gymnosperms. And we've got uh, 14,000 and change genera and the pines would be one genera, the oaks would be one genera in the angiosperms. Um, and then we've got uh, 304,000 different species compared to the, the uh, 1,088 uh, there. So as we look at this, to look at the relationship between these two, not only do we have a lot more families, genera, and species, but when we look at these and the relationship between them, um, 
we have uh, the ratio between in gymnosperms between families and genera is about one to six. In the angiosperms, which are the maples, beeches, birches, and walnuts, and so many other plants, is one to 36. We've got 29 times more families. And then with the, uh, the number of species, we've got 1,088 in gymnosperms. That's about a 1 to 12 ratio. And then in the angiosperms, we've got a 1 to 21. So in every aspect, uh, any way you want to measure it, we've got a lot more of those angiosperms. But we all love our, our pines and our evergreens. Now, I mentioned that I was going to show you a little bit of geology, and this is it. This is the geologic time frame, time uh, chart. And uh, so as you look at this, one of the things uh, that I wanted to point out to you is, uh, you know, these numbers over on the side, on the right hand side, and you ought to be able to see my uh, cursor moving up and down uh, right now. So we go back 65 million years ago. And that's when one of the dinosaurs looked up in the sky, saw a big rock falling out of the sky and says, oh, hell bells, uh, it's going to be a bad day for all of us. Uh, so that was 65 million years ago. Now, as we move on down a little bit, um, we look at the Pennsylvanian period and the Mississippian period. And this is the carbonaceous period right here. This is very important uh, to Kentucky and Virginia and West Virginia, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, because this is when all of the coal was formed. And so we had about a 65 million year period when the coal was being formed. And then um, that was the distance back in time when uh, the dinosaurs uh, so you think you, the dinosaurs were a long, long time ago, but in reality, uh, the coal was formed much, much longer ago than that. Uh, it was 290 million years ago to 354 million years ago. But the time period during that formation of coal was about the same duration as it's been since the, the dinosaurs went extinct. So as we look at that, um, we go back uh, 540 million years, and that's when we see the first animals showing up on, on planet Earth. And that was at the beginning of the Cambrian period. So let's uh, look a little bit more detail at this. The KT boundary, uh, Cretaceous uh, Triassic, is... Uh, where the, the uh, asteroid hit in the Yucatan and resulted in the death of, uh, of all of the dinosaurs. That was right after the first of the angiosperms, the maples, birches, beeches, all of those plants that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the first earliest forms of those that they've been able to define in the fossil record were formed. The first conifers were formed during the coal period, and the first gymnosperms, the non-conifer uh, relatives of the, the pine spruces and firs, etc., was formed about 400 million years ago. So these are ancient, ancient plants. Um, and so uh, they were formed uh, right after, you know, about 100 million years after the first of the animals. And so the plants were very, very primitive. Uh, the trees that we all think of were having some nice height to them now. They were all very, very low at that time period. And so the, the trees actually began to develop uh, with some of the gymnosperms and later the big trees with the angiosperms began to develop so that they could get high enough off the ground to capture or grab enough of the sunlight uh, that we're looking at it. So let's uh, back away from the geologic uh, chart just for a minute. And uh, wood uh, that we're all familiar with is made up of a couple of materials. One is cellulose and the other one is lignin.
Cellulose is usually a, a lighter color material and it adds flexibility to the trees. So when we see the ice loading up on the trees here in Lexington, they don't break initially because there's so much cellulose in that and that adds the flexibility. Same thing for the wind. The wind blows and the trees are able to, to blow back and forth and don't uh, snap. Lignin adds rigidity. And so uh, the, the cellulose is uh, very much like starches that are bound together. And uh, they have very similar uh, chemical bonds all the way along. So the, the cellulose digesting fungi developed first. The lignin digesting fungi developed second. And so they, it took a long time for the lignin digesting uh, fungi to be able to figure out how to break those complex chemical bonds that are in lignin. Now, li I mentioned cellulose is usually a lighter color. And lignin, uh, if you're a good master gardener, you're used to using a lot of peat moss in uh, containers and even sometimes in uh, the big planter boxes that we use. Peat moss is a brown color. That's predominantly lignin. Uh, and so it does not break down very readily. Now let's roll back to that geologic time clock. Uh, now, you see right here in the Carbonaceous period where the coal was formed uh, about 290 to 350 million years ago, that's where the first of the lignin digesting fungi developed, right at the end of the Pennsylvanian period. And so I remember uh, a school teacher talking to us about coal and oil, and this was in elementary school. And she says, well, coal and, coal and oil are, are being formed so slowly uh, that, uh, you know, we're using it faster than it's uh, being reformed. And I went, yes, yes, I can remember that for the test. And sure enough, it showed up on the test. Well, the Pennsylvanian period ended because these lignin digesting fungi began to digest all of the, the, uh, the wood that was flowing out of the, uh, the Appalachian range and Appalachians were originally about the height of the Rockies, maybe even the Himalayas. They're not real sure about the ultimate height of them, but they were much, much taller and much wider um, in, as far as the mountain range than they are today. And I was talking to Phil uh, earlier and, uh, and Jeremy earlier, uh, and I said there used to be coal deposits on top of where Lexington is, but Lexington sits on a dome, and though we're about the same elevation as eastern Kentucky, all of our shale, all of our coal, all of our sandstone weathered away. It's now down in the Gulf of Mexico, and so uh, we all of our coal deposits were lost over this part of the of the state uh, but they originally uh, would have been now the uh, the western Kentucky area and the southern Illinois area still has their coal deposits um, so the, anyway that's a little bit about the the geology that I find quite interesting being a Kentuckian uh, now so uh, the lignin digesting fungi uh, we will never have the coal deposits uh, as long as uh, you know the Earth exists, there will never be coal deposits again formed in the same volume that they are there. They were formed back at this time period. So uh, the other thing I wanted to just point out was uh, the KT boundary, uh, where the dinosaurs went extinct, and they there is they use the K for Cretaceous. Uh, the C and the K make the same sound, but the, the K was also uh, used uh, for the uh, Cambrian period, uh, which is using the, the C uh, as, an, as an abbreviation for that by geologists. And so the Cretaceous tertiary uh, boundary right there uh, is uh, one of the areas where we, we oftentimes think back. And as a little boy, I loved the dinosaurs. And I was really tickled as a young adult uh, when Jurassic Park came out. So Jurassic Park, the Jurassic period, is right in the middle of the um, 
the time when the, the dinosaurs lived. They lived all three of these uh, periods right there. So quite a long period of time in there. And looking at the, um, the time, the age of the dinosaurs, uh, we've got a lot of our codifers that were very active uh, in the development. We know from the fossil record, uh, a lovely, lovely uh, uh, conifer that is good for a patio plant is the umbrella pine. It's not a true pine, it's in the pine family, but it's Cyadapodus, and it's an ancient plant, and it's one of those plants that I love to see, and when I see it, I have to go up and I touch it. It feels like plastic, and so if you want a really nice um, specimen that'll make a nice container plant uh, for the um, for the patio area, the umbrella pine is is a good one because it has a, an umbrella shape uh, arrangement uh, to the needles. The needles are uh, come out from one point and look like uh, all of the cloth out of the umbrella has uh, disappeared. So then we've got our pines, which are are about 150 million years old. The uh, the Texas. Uh, which are in Taxaceae, are even older than that. And then Aracaria um, is in Aracariaceae. It's an, also a very, very old plant. If you've got a warm, protected area, we're right on the borderline of being able to grow Aracaria quite well. And so I think in, in Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, Virginia, where you have a valley where it's going to be pointing towards the Southeast, the Aracaria might be an interesting plant to grow out in the landscape. And it's called the um, uh, China fir. It's not a true fir at all but it's got very, very sharp needles on it. And then the uh, cupressus are the uh, this true cypress. It's not the ball cypress that I'll mention earlier. And then podocarpus is a really nice indoor, here indoor plant. You'll see it outdoor in Louisiana and Texas and Florida. Uh, you'll see it uh, growing out there. It's an evergreen plant, but it's uh, it's also a very very old plant, and is uh, broad is uh, the needles on it almost look like they are broadleaf, uh, but they are true needles. So here's a picture. Uh, you know, if you were way out in space, this is what uh, the Earth would look like if you could unroll it from being a globe or. or a, the whole uh, circle of uh, the globe of the earth and could lay it out so that you would be able to see the whole thing at one time. And this is what you would be able to see. And we all recognize those uh, continents out there. This is what it looked like at the end of the Triassic period about 200 million years ago. And so Laurasia um, gets its name from the St. Lawrence Seaway and Asia, and they were able to match up some of the geologic characteristics between uh, Eastern North America and Asia. And you can see a little bit of the uh, appearance of what North America would have looked like. Uh, this would have been Europe, and then certainly all of Asia over here on the right-hand side. Gondwana uh, gets its name from a, a province uh, in India. And so Gondwana was made up of uh, South America. And uh, there's my cursor. Uh, it was made up of South America, which fits really nicely into Africa. Antarctica, which has some coal deposits in it, surprisingly enough, it doesn't have any plant material uh, now, but it was part of the, uh, it was once uh, warmer than it is today. And so here's India. Uh, India was attached to Antarctica and uh, very close to uh, Africa. And then Australia uh, is over here. And so those are all referred to as Gondwana. And so the, when you start traveling around the earth and looking at different plants and looking at different animals, uh, you'll find that the, the animals and the plants of, of North America, Europe, and Asia are very, very similar. 
this is where we find all of the pines, all of the spruces, all of the firs, uh, and all of the oaks, all of the maples. You don't find native maples in South America and Africa, uh, India, and Australia. Uh, now, I remember as a kid, uh, before I heard about uh, the uh, Laurasia and Godwana, I, I remember thinking, hmm, the possum, which we all know, uh, the possum is a marsupial. It's got a pouch, uh, just like a kangaroo has. How the heck did a kangaroo-like animal get into North America? And in reality, North America and South America were only joined together about 3 million years ago when the Panama uh, area uh, finally um, connected the two together. And at that point, the raccoon, which is a native North American animal, went south into uh, South America and raised heck and caused all kinds of problems as an invasive species. And the possum came north and crossed that land bridge into North America and as a then non-native species caused a lot of uh, extinctions too. And so those are a few of the, the characteristics. Now, the reason I went into all of that detail is this has to do with coevolution. So back a long time ago, before Laurasia uh, split apart, we had ashes in North America, we had ashes in what became Europe, and we had ashes in what became Asia. And all of these were very, very similar. But the continents began to split apart and we began to see some uh, subtle differences. So uh, as we look at people and animals, uh, it hadn't been that long since uh, the, the human beings really began to wander out of Africa and we began to take on different, geo uh, different physical um, characteristics. So some people developed lighter skin or different shapes to the noses. Uh, the Aleutian uh, people, the Eskimos, uh, Inuits, developed, uh, you know, the fatty deposits on the uh, cheekbone, which helped them to, to keep their sinuses from freezing, and so on and so forth. So we can look at all of those different characteristics in humans. The same thing happened with plants. And so this little critter down here sitting on uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's face on the penny right there is the emerald ash borer. It came out of Asia. And so uh, the Chinese sent us, we think, sent us some pallets uh, and lied to us saying that they had uh, heat treated all of the wood in the pallets and they didn't. And so the emerald ash borer came out of that and they came into uh, an area around Detroit and Windsor, Canada. And so it uh, developed, um, it started uh uh, it came out and of uh, the pallets, it began to find places or uh, looking for places where the females could lay their eggs. And uh, so all of these native North American ashes, uh, which had no resistance whatsoever. So the Asian ashes had co-evolved with the, uh, the emerald ash borer, and they got along fairly well together. Uh, the, the emerald ash borer didn't kill the ashes off until they got uh, stressed too much. We see the same thing with humans. When the Europeans came over to North America and South America, they brought the common coal and the measles and the mumps and the flu and all of these other diseases that the Europeans had become accustomed to, and it, it caused a tremendous crash in the population of Native Americans in both North and South America. They had no resistance uh, to these diseases. We also see this with the hemlock woolly adilgid. 
So uh, the picture on the left hand side is our eastern hemlock and you've got a lot of those in your counties uh, and it's a beautiful plant. It's a lovely one. I've got a picture uh, down in the Smokies of myself standing in front of a Canadian hemlock or an eastern hemlock and I've got my arms fully spread um, all the way out as far as I can reach and you can see bark on both sides of my fingernails. Uh, the trunk was uh, about seven feet in diameter. And that's how big the, the Canadian hemlock or Eastern hemlock used to grow. The, uh, the Japanese hemlock was introduced into uh, North America um, early in the 20th century. And this is it right here. It doesn't have quite the same form, but it brought the, uh, the, uh, the hemlock woolly adilgid in. And so I think everybody in eastern uh, Kentucky and West Virginia and Virginia and Tennessee certainly is aware of the Canadian of the uh, hemlock woolly adilgid and how devastating it is uh, to that. Uh, so that's uh, you know what the the problem is with that. So uh, Bill Fountain, uh, being the the curious horticulturist that he is, I got a hold of uh, the. Uh, uh, Japanese hemlock, uh, which you see here, the Seabold eye, and uh, also got a, uh, a, 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 a Chinese hemlock, uh, which was a Tosuga uh, sinensis, and I planted them out in uh, my woods, and I thought, you know, hemlock woolly adilgid is coming to me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, you know, going to have to deal with it, so I, uh, you know, uh, got these hemlocks and I started growing them on. I thought, you know, I can take some pollen, I bet, off of our native North American hemlock. And when my two uh, Asian hemlocks begin to produce cones on them, I can then put some uh, pollen from one parent onto the other and then switch it back, back and forth. So I'm pollinating both of them, collect those seeds, and I'll bet uh, that given enough time, I can find a, uh, a Canadian hemlock form that will have some resistance to it. Uh, may not be in my lifetime, uh, it may be something my kids will make a, a fortune off of. Well, here is my eastern, uh, my um, uh, uh, Canadian hemlock, not Canadian hemlock, but the uh, Japanese hemlock or the uh, the Chinese hemlock. I forget which one this was. Uh, but anyway, this is the the elongated hemlock scale, and the elongated hemlock scale is a native North American pest. It's a scale insect. It doesn't bother our hemlocks until the hemlock really becomes stressed out. And it's sort of like we used to refer to pneumonia as being the old person's friend. And uh, it was a not too painful way of uh, passing on to the next world. And so uh, it, uh, you know, was something that just took out the old people before we had antibiotics. And so uh, that's what the hemlo elongated hemlock scale did. Well, it jumped all over my two Asian hemlocks and I almost lost them until I got it under control. So provenance is a word that uh, I think is good for master gardeners to know. Provenance means where that species evolved. Now, I'm, I'm not a native Kentuckian. I was actually born in North Carolina, in Western North Carolina, in the mountains of uh, around Asheville. And so my provenance, some would say, is Western North Carolina. But actually, it's not. If you're looking at the screen and seeing my face, you see, uh, you know, the light colored skin, uh, the prematurely, it's not premature anymore. It used to be premature, but the, the hair that is turned gray and is now white. Um, you see different facial features uh, for the shape of the ears and the nose and all. And so you would look at my provenance as being North European. Now, I've never lived in North Europe, but that's where my ancestors came from. Uh, it's not to be confused with the word providence, 
which means God's gift. So we see a lot of churches, uh, you know, called Providence uh, Baptist Church or something, uh, or New Providence, uh, you know, church. Uh, you see that word used, and it really means just God's gift. So by Providence, I'm here, I'm safe, I'm uh, well uh, and is a very, very different word and meaning than provenance. So provenance is a, is a good word to be aware of. And that is part of the definition of when we talk about what's native and what's not native. And so when we look at disjunct species, these are plants that are very, very similar. Now, the Pinus virginiana, Virginia pine. Uh, so, Phil, this is one that uh, got named for your uh, state, uh, the Virginia pine. And so it looks almost identical to the jack pine, which doesn't grow here naturally, but you would find that in northern Michigan and Wisconsin and southern Canada and uh, northern Pennsylvania, etc. The two of them look almost identical, and I really have to look at them close to be able to tell the difference between the two of them. So these are disjunct species. They have begun to evolve slightly differently. Uh, now they're on the same continent, but they're very, very similar in appearance, but they are beginning or have begun to become different species. Now, I also wanted to throw in a little bit on risk assessment. And uh, Jeremy, if y'all want me to come back and talk sometime on risk assessment, I can do that. Uh, risk is the likelihood of something happening times the consequences. So we have a law here in Kentucky that says if you're in an automobile, you by law must have your seatbelt fastened. Now the likelihood of you having an automobile accident is very, very low. So that's the likelihood. But the consequences of hitting something and going through the through the windshield are very, very dire. So if you've ever been involved in an automobile accident and had your seatbelt on, you were very, very glad that you had that seatbelt on. So the risk of driving without a seatbelt on is very, very high, even though the likelihood of something happening is very, very low. The consequences outweigh that. So we as arborists, do, can do tree risk assessments. And we predict the likelihood of failure times the likelihood that that hazard, which is the tree in this case, would strike the target, which you see as the house, and then what the consequences are. We would assess the consequences. Well, the house can be repaired. If it's an individual that we're worried about, uh, you can't replace individuals. So the consequences of this tree hitting an, uh, an individual is going to be very, very high, and it's going to give you a very high risk rating uh, as a result of that. So when we we look at a lot of different things uh, when we're looking at risk, uh, we look at the, the way trees behave under loading. And so we, you see up there, there's a yellow block and I've got a black arrow in there. Think of that as the ice storm that has come in and has loaded that tree and is now pushing it from the left side to the right. Or maybe it's the 50 or 60 mile an hour wind uh, that's in a thunderstorm. And so on the right hand side of that tree, that tree is going to buckle and that is called compression. And then on the left-hand side of the tree, as it uh, is pushed over, it's going to pull those fibers apart and it's going to be called uh, tension. And so when we have something under tension, those, those uh, fibers break. And if you put your hands together and move them back and forth, and you can do this, you're on Zoom, so nobody's watching you, move them back and forth uh, like this, what you will feel as you put your hand under tension and compression and alternate back and forth, you will feel your palms sliding against each other. And that is the sheer plane of failure and will result in a break right through the middle of the pith. 
And then the fourth uh, type of twisting uh, type of action that we have that breaks trees apart is torsion. And that is just simply the twisting that the tree will have. Uh, and there are many different ways of getting that torsion uh, by doing that. So uh, we, we look at the tension wood, uh, you know, the, this formed on the tension side, the compression wood that would be formed on the compression side, and then um, that shear plane of failure where it's crossing, and then finally the twisting action that's there. So one of the things that we uh, have learned to do um, in the time that I've been an arborist is look and think about trees very, very differently. And we look at trees as uh, compartmentalizing. Plants do not heal. And so uh, if you say something about, well, the tree has healed over, I'll probably just keep my mouth closed. But I'm thinking trees don't heal. Woody plants don't heal. No plant has the ability to heal. Healing is the repairing and replacing of damaged tissues. So if you cut yourself, you're going to heal. You'll form scar tissue. And so it'll close up that wound and it'll make new tissue uh, where none uh, was uh, present. And uh, that's, that's what healing is. So plants close their wounds and they build walls uh, against the, the spread of decay and also against the spread of insects. Uh, so we, we talk about wound wood. And so on the uh, left-hand side or really in the center of the picture, you see a, where a branch was removed and we've got wound wood roll, which is very gradually grown in and is covering, has almost completely covered over that wound. And here on the right hand side, we see a big wound, could have been a lightning strike or something else. But we've got that wound wood that has formed from both sides of it. Uh, now, we have reaction wood, and I've already alluded to that when I said tension wood and compression wood. And so our angiosperms form tension wood. And tension in uh, this tree, which is leaning right here, uh, the tension side of it is where all of the weight of the tree and the, uh, the canopy of the tree is as far uh, to the, uh, the uh, you know, ground as, uh, as you would expect it to be. It has a symmetrical crown on it. And so it is pulling on that tree. And I can look at this tree and say, hmm. I don't think this tree is going to fall over because when I look at it, I begin to see uh, that the tree comes down and I've got a lot more uh, tension wood on this side. And so without knowing anything more about that, this is an angiosperm. It's a maple, ash, dogwood, uh, you know, birch, any number of other trees like that. It is not a conifer. Conifers would have laid down extra wood on that compression side. So tension wood forms on the top and is only on the angiosperms. Compression wood, and this is a conifer, forms on the bottom of a branch. And so as I look at this particular branch, I think, wow, this is a big branch. I hope it doesn't fall and hit that transformer box or that switching box right there for some electrical systems, because it would certainly knock out the electrical system for, uh, for everything that is connected to. But then I noticed that there is a lot of compression wood on the bottom side of this particular branch. And I think, mm -mm, not really worried about it. So the compression wood is going to be very important to look for on our gymnosperms or our conifers and ginkgo. Uh, down at the bottom. Now, this is a cross section of a spruce, a Colorado blue spruce. They got loaded down um, about 10 years before the branch was taken off. And you can see how the branch was, was forming annual growth rings in the middle of it. And then it got pulled down to the, the, the ground. And it, it remained on the ground for a number of years, but the tree began to produce a lot of compression wood 
on that bottom side of the branch and you can see how the the branches have uh, annual growth rings on the bottom side of that branch that are much much thicker than these tiny little rings up at the very top and it actually took that branch and it cranked it back up so that it, it was now more vertical uh, after a period of about 10 years so if you have a tree and it uh, gets loaded down with ice, resist the urge to go out and shake it off. Those uh, fibers, uh, the vessels on the inside of that branch are frozen and you're going to break the ice crystals in there and destroy the conduct conductive nature of those cells. Leave it alone and eventually, either angiosperm or gymnosperm, it will write those branches again. Uh, so that's one of the characteristics. Now I mentioned uh, torsion, uh, and here's a pine tree, a white pine, uh, very, very common in Eastern Kentucky and around all of our landscapes. And this is one that suffered uh, from that torsion and it, uh, it split uh, along the sheer plane of failure uh, right through the middle. So this goes through the pith. I would not worry about this particular branch because it has so much compression wood on the bottom side of that pith. It's been like that for a long, long time. And so that's one of the things that we look at. Uh, we also have reaction wood. I've mentioned the wound wood is one type that closes over the wounds that we've made. Uh, we've got tension wood and compression wood. And then we've got flexure wood. Uh, flexure, flexure wood is uh, resulting from the swaying of the loading of a tree back and forth. So in a forest situation, you don't have as big a buttress roots on the tree as you would out in a home landscape for the same size tree. Now the forester would come in and would cut a tree and is going to stay above that buttress uh, right out there and just leave the stump out, out there in the, the woodland area. But in a woodland area, you've got a much nicer log, not only because the trees have, have been shaded, uh, the lower branches on the tree have been shaded, but also because you have a very minimal amount of buttress root right there. And uh, so here's, here's a bit of the snow there. But those buttress roots are just like uh, standing out on the snow, which is pictured here, and uh, you spread your feet a little bit farther apart so that you, you have better stability. And it's those buttress roots uh, that spread out that help to keep you upright, keep you from falling down. So here is a tropical tree, uh, Kepak. Uh, we, this was in Singapore, and uh, Singapore is always tropical, 365 days a year. Uh, it's just like any day uh, in August, except it's more humid than any place you would find in Kentucky. The humidity will be on a very dry day will be 90%. Uh, so this is Fletcher wood because they, of all the rainfall that they have, the trees form these big buttress roots. And this is a picture of me. I'm, I'm six feet tall. And uh, so they have formed uh, the Fletcher wood, uh, those big buttress roots out there to help protect it because the roots are, are very shallow. And this particular tree was about 120 feet tall. So that's how all trees stand up. One of the things that we uh, consider uh, when we look at trees and we move them out into the landscape, uh, learning how to read the body language of trees is I look for the, uh, the flared out area that's just above the root system here. And these are circling roots and they are actually girdling the tree. If you put a piece of a copper bracelet around the, the arm of a child and you never take it off and it doesn't have the ability to to expand and it's a tight band, uh, doesn't have a gap in there, uh, then that is eventually going to girdle uh, the child's arm and it, it will uh, end up uh, causing a lot of damage. So the same thing happens with trees and uh, the trunks on them. 
Lunyap is a um, a term that I I really like. Uh, it's a it's not an English word. It's a Cajun word, and the closest thing that we have for it in English is a, a baker's dozen. It means something a little bit extra for nothing. And the Cajuns would use this if you came into my store and uh, your, your kids came into my store and I was selling candy and I recognized them as being your kids. I would say, oh, you're Phil's daughter or Phil's son. OK, you, you've got your your nickel, your dime. Here's the amount of candy that you you would uh, buy uh, with that uh, the little bit of change that you've got. And I would wink at them and put uh, two more pieces out there and wink at them. I made sure that they saw me wink at them. And I'd say, la yap, something a little bit extra for nothing. So we have five conifers. Uh, four of them are somewhat common. Uh, the Chinese swamp cypress, which is down here at the bottom, is very, very rare. Uh, I have only seen it, uh, I think, once uh, in all of my career. Uh, looks very much like the bald cypress right here. But Dawn Redwood is a type of deciduous conifer. In fact, all five of these are deciduous conifers. So in the fall of the year, the Dawn Redwood is going to drop all of its foliage. It comes from Asia. It came out of China. It once grew in North America and in Europe, part of Laurasia. But it became extinct because of the it couldn't outrun the glaciers. Bald cypress is a native of North America. And so we, we see that as taxodium, the bald cypress. I grew up, uh, lived for a while in South Louisiana. I love being out in the swamps, the cypress swamps, and love those bald cypress. And I've got a bald cypress uh, out in my yard just to remind me of, uh, you know, many nice times that I had out fishing in the, uh, the swamps of South Louisiana. The larch is a native of North America. There is a European larch, and there is also an Asian larch. The bald cypress doesn't grow anywhere but North America. The false larch is found only in Asia. And then the Chinese swamp cypress, Glyptostrobus, uh, looks very much like our bald cypress. In fact, you would have trouble telling the two of them apart. Um, there, you would have to look at the fruit uh, really to be able to tell the two of them easily apart. And it's native of Asia. Now, North America, Asia, and Europe. All five of these are Laurasian plants. They all developed uh, before the, uh, the continents began to split apart. You don't find any of them native to South America, Africa, um, Australia, or India. Uh, and then uh, you don't find uh, them in Antarctica or any other plant. So the reason for that is... And this is sometimes what I ask of plant material students. And I'll uh, flash a, a slide up like this. This is a picture of the Earth. It was taken uh, well away from the Earth. It was one of the pictures that NASA took uh, when uh, the astronauts went to the moon. And here's your hint, 23.5 degrees. And if you're familiar with that and recognize the picture, you would immediately say, oh, that's the angle that the Earth rotates at. It sits on a 23 and a half degree axis. And were it not like that, uh, we would every day would be the same day length all year long. And uh, so they would uh, that we would not have the warming and the cooling uh, associated with the change in seasons. Uh, so we wouldn't have the winter times when the days were short and the nights were long. And we wouldn't have the warm summers here in uh, Kentucky and Virginia where the, uh, the days were very, very long. The nights were short uh, and such. So the, the reason for this, the hint is all five of these were once native in the far northern latitudes, up uh, north of where Greenland currently is. 
up north of where the current uh, Arctic Circle is. And so back when these were growing, uh, the earth was much, much warmer than it is today. But they, they, the earth was still at the 23 and a half degree axis. And so these five conifers had to develop a way of uh, dropping all of their foliage when, quote, winter came on and it became very, very dark for a long period of time. What we would associate with as a uh, winter in uh, in Alaska or northern Canada or something like that. Now, I happened to be in uh, uh, Edinburgh, Scotland one time, uh, and it was between Christmas and New Year's. Edinburgh, Scotland, which is much warmer than Alaska, is about the same latitude as Anchorage. And I was shocked at the day length. I didn't realize it. That was the first time I had been in a far northern latitude in the dead of winter or, or the, the, the shortest day of the year. Because at 10 o'clock in the morning, you would see the first little hint of light on uh, December 30, uh, 21st when the shortest day was. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was pitch black dark. And I thought... I like Scotland, but I don't like this day length. Uh, so uh, those were a, a few comments that I had on that. Uh, this is the epitaph, uh, Phil and uh, Jeremy, uh, that I have uh, told my wife that I want on my side of the tombstones. Ah, so many plants, so little time. Uh, so I'm going to kill the uh, uh, screen share at this point. And um, so uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, we can uh, handle those. I've used up most of the hour, uh, but we'll be glad to handle, you know, take on any questions. Dr. Fountain, great information. If you do have a question for him, uh, you can type it in the chat pod or you can unmute yourself whichever way. So definitely okay. some great information there. Thanks okay. so much. It was, it was a little bit of a, a wide range of different types of topics, uh, but uh, this is one of the ways I like to teach. Uh, and master gardeners are, are a very, very special group of people. Uh, you have a, a, a real curiosity about uh, the way things work and the interrelationship between different things. And I love talking to master gardeners and, and bringing some of these loose pieces together. So we talked about insects, we talked about diseases, we talked about continental drift uh, and geology and dinosaurs and a little bit of extra everything else tonight. So. I think I think you covered it all. <laughs> At least, I, I shouldn't say maybe not all of it, but a lot of the aspects of it. How's yes. that? <laughs> uh, anyway, a lot a lot of different topics and sort of pull together those loose ends. Definitely and great it, information. Great Dr. stuff. Dr. Fountain, Dr. Fountain, yes. I'll mention that yep. two of Master Gardeners here are also Master Naturalists. So oh, fantastic. So, so they, they've, they're interested in geology as well. So oh, good, good. So anyway, uh, I. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, studying geology, and I still have my rock collection from when I was a, a boy. And uh, you know, if if somebody came to the house and I realized that they were a geologist, they had to come back to my bedroom, and I told them all, showed them all the different rock collections, uh, things which was, uh, I guess, a little audacious of me talking to some of these. Uh, you know, geologists, trained geologists that were working with some of the oil companies and really knew a whole lot more than I did. And uh, so I heard one of them say, uh, you know, to my parents, boy, he really has a good rock collection. <laughs> and so my uh, parents had to that point had always referred to it as gravel. So <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's good stuff. Good stuff. Well, wait, uh, if, if nobody has any questions or whatever, uh, Dr. Fountain, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate you coming on tonight and, and joining us and uh, uh, trudging into campus. Uh, it's froze over there in Lexington, so we really appreciate it. And uh, we wish you safe travels back home. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And one thing I will mention to you, I've got, I will get a, an email out uh, shortly uh, to all agents, but I'm uh, really mentioning this to Phil, since you're 
um, outside of the Kentucky email system, I'm going to have a tree risk assessment uh, workshop uh, this fall in September, hopefully uh, when we can get rid of these things, uh, you know, and uh, start having a, you know, so a little more face to face, but I'm going to have this, I'm going to limit it to agents so that we can talk about some agent type problems. Uh, some of the agents that will be attending it uh, are, are going to pay the full fee and get the, the qualification, which is through ISA. And if there are open spots, I will allow other agents to come in without getting the qualification and taking the exam there. So I would, I would let y'all in and I'll even open it up to a Virginian uh, since I've, uh, my, my uh, grandmother Phil uh, was from Richmond, Virginia. My grandmother Fountain. And uh, so she got married when she was 21, 22 years old, something like that, and uh, moved to Mississippi where my grandfather lived. And when she was 85 and passed away, before she passed away, they would uh, come up to her and say, Mrs. Fountain, where are you from? And she would say, I am a Virginian. And yet <laughs> she had lived for most of her life in Mississippi. <laughs> oh, anyway, I, I claim to be, uh, you know, part Virginian, even though I've never lived in Virginia. So, so good to well, see I, you. I would be, I'd be very interested in the tree assessment if there's room for a Virginian. So I'll. Yes. Uh, so it'll be at Moorhead at at the uh, research uh, state uh, farm. There is where it mm -hmm. is, and uh, I can give you those dates now if you wanna. If you've got mm -hmm. a second. Um, Okay, it'll be uh, September 21 to 23. Okay. And the 23rd would be 